Hi, I'm Kate Warren and happy to welcome you to today's Newsmaker event with Lawrence Haddad, Executive Director of GAIN and also Chair of Action Track One of the UN Food Systems Summit to discuss how governments and the global community can ensure access to safe and nutritious food for all. Um, I'm joined by my colleague and DevX reporter, Teresa Welsh, who will be leading the conversation today. Um, hi, Teresa, how are you doing? Hi, Kate, good. I'm so excited to be with you today. It's a big day for us at DevX. It is. Um, so, well, you have been reporting on the UN Food Systems Summit, including hosting a series of events around the pre-summit this summer, back when we weren't sure when or where this summit would actually happen. Exactly. But it is happening next week. Um, and Lawrence is, as I said, the chair of Action Track One. For those who are going to newer this conversation, um, what does that mean and what are you hoping to learn from uh, Mr. Haddad today? Yeah, so the UN Food Systems Summit has been quite the process. Um, the UN Secretary General actually called for the summit before COVID, but of course the whole process has been colored by the pandemic that we've all been experiencing for a year and a half plus now. So Lawrence is the lead of Action Track One, which is focused on ensuring um, access to healthy and nutritious food. And so uh, that's one of five action tracks for the whole summit. And the idea was basically to look at the traditional silos that have been created around this issue of food systems and figure out a way to get all of these people in the same virtual rooms together, having conversations about reform. So Lawrence and his colleagues have been working um, over the last year and a half, um, majority, virtu majority virtual meetings on all of these issues. And uh, they were able to gather partially in person in Rome for the pre-summit. Um, and then the summit itself is taking place next week um, in New York, but virtually um, there won't be any actual physical event in New York happening next week. Great. Um, well, I'm excited to hear your conversation. Um, we're also not only excited about this, but we have another exciting announcement and that today is the official launch of our new newsletter, DevX Dish, which you, Teresa, will be authoring. Um, hopefully those of you who registered for today's event also subscribe to get this weekly newsletter on the transformation of food systems. Um, I have a lot of questions for you, Teresa, about what to expect and what our readers can look forward to in this newsletter, but I also don't want to hold you back from our conversation with Mr. Haddad, so I will pass the baton to you, and then we can regroup after your discussion so we can learn um, you know, all the things about this new DevX Dish newsletter. Excellent. Thanks so much, Kate. All right. Thanks, Teresa. Now I am so pleased to be joined by Lawrence Haddad, who leads the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Lawrence. My pleasure, Teresa. I am so thrilled to have you for this DevX Dish launch event. Um, you are such the perfect person for this. And actually on more of a personal note, I recall interviewing you three years ago at the uh, World Food Prize when you and David Navarro won that prize. And that was sort of the first food systems type event I covered for DevX and really piqued my interest in this topic. And uh, now we are launching this newsletter and we obviously have the Food System Summit coming next week. So I'm really thrilled to be talking to you at this particular moment. So it's really nice to see you. Great to see you too. So to start out, um, I imagine a lot of our audience is quite familiar with this topic of food systems, but in case we do have some tuning in with us that are not, Lawrence, what is a food system and why is that something that people should care about? So a food system is, you know, kind of every actor, every organization, every relationship that connects soil health to gut health, everything and everything in between, really, from production, processing, distribution, storage, supply, transport, uh, marketing, advertising, purchasing, consuming, preparation, er everything. Um, it involves food and non-food actors, governments, businesses, civil society organizations, research organizations, the UN, um, pretty much all those actors. And it's how they, how they interact or don't interact based on the signals that they're given from prices and other kinds of regulation and legislation. Uh, that generates a series of outcomes. And those outcomes are either good for people, planet, and prosperity, or they are bad 
the people planet and prosperity and often it depends where you live uh, and and what your income uh, level is as to whether they're good or bad so we know that um, poor diets are responsible for half the drivers of the burden of disease premature mortality and morbidity we know that um, food choices in the production sector uh, and processing sector determine about a third of greenhouse gas emissions. We know that food is uh, a big reason, the way food is produced and consumed is a big driver of biodiversity loss. We know that the food system employs at least a billion people uh, and probably more. So for all those reasons, food systems really matter. And you, you mentioned several topics there that touch on various SDGs. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons the Sustainable Development Goals, that's one of the reasons this topic is so important. How, how does food systems and food systems reform, how will that help us achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030? Well, it pretty much, you know, it, it pretty much affects all the Sustainable Development Goals. We did a, a piece of analysis and, and food systems are directly, because food, think about it, um, Teresa, each one of us eats food. We make decisions about food. Um, it touches everyone's lives. It's an everyday topic. And it's so inter intimately connected with our, our health, our education, our poverty, our, our nutrition, our climate, our environment, everything, uh, our jobs, gender relationships, partnerships, energy use. So it's, it's, it's everywhere. And um, that's what makes this Food System Summit so powerful. It has the potential to, to really accelerate sustainable development towards the SDG targets for 2030. And you, of course, have been intimately involved with the UN Food System Summit process. You are the chair of Action Track One. Um, Tell us a little bit about your involvement in the process. What has that meant for your day-to-day -day over the past, you know, nearly two years, I think, of this process? Um, what has it involved on your end? Who have you been talking to? How are you interacting with other people that are working on this issue? Well, it's um, working on the summit and it's, you know, really for the last year and a half, maybe a year and a quarter, I've spent at least half my time working on the summit and some months, much more than that. Um, why have I been doing it? I, I've been doing it because I think it, it we, you know, we have an obligation, food, food is a big part of the problem, but it can be such a massive part of the solution. So we, and the world is in dire need of solutions right now. So we have an obligation to, to be heavily involved in this, uh, whoever we are. Um, number two, it's really, it's really unveiled for me, a sense of how intimately connected all the outcomes are. You know, we talk about we talk about human rights being indivisible. You can't pick and choose which human right you want to protect and respect and fulfill. It's the same with these outcomes. You know, you can't say we're going to only focus on nutrition. You have to focus on the consequences for these other outcomes. So I think it's really helped me and Gain and others engage with that. It's also helped really push us, everybody think more deeply. You know, when you think of change, you think of policy change, legislation, you think of resource allocation change, but we kind of know what to do. We know how to do it. It's, it's, it's digging deeper. What are the deeper levels? What's stopping that change happening? What are the vested interests? What are the incentives looking like? Uh, what are the prices telling us? The prices are telling us, keep going, keep going, generating bad food, keep, keep going and polluting the environment because other people will have to pay for that. And then finally, the sort of deepest mindset, the deepest shift is a mindset shift. Um, you know, the, the recognition that actually we do have to pay attention to all of these things at the same time. Actually, that means we have to change the way we organize our organizations, the way we redefine our mission statements, the way we fundraise, the way we partner, the way we measure progress. All of these things are deeply fundamental shifts. And I think being involved in Action Track One has, has immersed me and all my, my colleagues in that. Being, being an Action Track chair means that you are bombarded with new ideas and new relationships. And that's 
that's that's energizing and if you're not careful it can become exhausting um, but most of the time it's energizing new ideas from around the world new partners that you've never dream, dreamed of working with but actually when you look at it they're we're working on very similar issues in very similar ways but just with this this thinly veiled curtain between between the two of you working in silos and so working on the summit has been about busting those silos about being exposed to new ideas and about learning how to how to create uh, coherence out of a, a cacophony of noise uh, and trying to trying to to create something that is meaningful impactful and sustainable so it's been absolutely exhilarating uh, and, and sometimes exhausting yeah, I remember in one of our previous conversations, you told me I've never spoken to so many climate people in my life as a mm. part of the process. It's been it's been great, and and livelihood people and biodiversity people. These are these are people who I should be talking to, but because we all specialize and become siloed, uh, there are very few opportunities to break out of that, and I feel very privileged to have the opportunity to do that. And obviously, one of the issues that you have dedicated a lot of your career to is the issue of malnutrition and your action track is focused on ensuring access to safe and nutritious food for all. Um, and of course, the the malnutrition numbers are not good. We saw in this year's state of um, the state of food insecurity in the world report, the SOFI report, that numbers are bleak. And unfortunately, that was what was predicted after COVID. And we did see that come through. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the stakes. I mean, what are we looking at right now? And what could happen if we don't turn this around when it comes to malnutrition? Well, I've, you know, the, the two pieces of information you have, one has hard information, are the hunger numbers. And the projections from the UN. And it's not surprising that hunger is going up, right? The poverty rates, if you look at the poverty numbers, in every year except 2009 and 2008 for the last 30 years, poverty numbers have come down, the absolute numbers. But when you look at the number for 2020, it's a big positive number, about 80 million plus. And that's, that's shocking. So that tells you that hunger numbers are going to go up. And of course they did, but they went up by more than I thought they would. They went up about, by about 118 million, uh, 650 to 768 million people. And of course, those are more than just numbers. They're, they're lives, um, people going to bed hungry, people waking up hungry and doing it all over again, again and again, until they either escape or they, they die. Um, the other second piece of information is the work the Standing Together for Nutrition Consortium did. Uh, this is essentially modelers from Johns Hopkins, IFPRI, and the World Bank getting together um, and making projections on, on the number of kids stunted, uh, stunted and wasted. So for wasting, these are thin, these are kids are thin, they're skin and bone, they look malnourished. And they're this is the most, um, they're the most at, at risk of mort premature mortality. And those numbers have gone up from are projected to go up by 40 uh, from 47 million to 60 million. So plus 13 million in two years, um, that's, that's, that's scary. So those are the two pieces of hard information we have. So what do we do about that? Um, I think you know, most governments are strapped for cash at the moment. They're, most of their money is going into COVID and, and, and uh, some of them to a lesser extent going into climate. Those are the two big imperatives of the day. How do we, in the nutrition and hunger community, how do we um, get some of those resources into the space that we care about? We care about COVID and, and climate, don't get me wrong, but how do we do double duty with those resources? So I think the nutrition and hunger community have to be very creative and, and reach out to people in those spaces. Every COVID response should have a nutrition package within it. Why is that? Vaccine, vaccination rates in Africa are 2%. We know that COVID severity thrives on comorbidities, some other illness, some other infection. We know that good nutrition status promotes immune systems and will make some of those comorbidities less likely. 
So that's one argument for getting nutrition interventions into that COVID response. What about nutrition into the climate response? Well, one example is we know UNICEF tells us um, young kids in low income settings and, and their mothers or mothers to be need to diversify their diet. They need more animal source foods. They're existing on monotonous diets of low nutrient dense staples. They need animal source foods. The climate folks will tell you, hold on a second. Those, those foods need to be produced in an environmentally low footprint kind of way. So here is an opportunity for nutrition and climate to get together to say, how do we produce these animal source foods for these low income populations in an environmentally um, low, low footprint way? So here's, here's another potential partnership between nutrition and climate using climate funds. Climate funds completely dwarf nutrition funds. I was looking at the numbers the other day uh, on aid. The aid numbers for nutrition, for direct nutrition interventions, 1 billion. The, if you expand the definition for, to programs that are, where nutrition isn't the primary goal, but probably have an impact on nutrition, you get to 5 billion. So 1 plus 5, 6 billion in aid. The EU's climate funding to countries that are exposed to, to climate risks, just the EU is 6 billion right wow. there. So, you know, the climate funding dwarfs nutrition. So we need to be able to get some of that uh, climate funding, not, not so we can do our stuff, but so we can do our stuff that also helps the climate people. So we need to be, so, sorry, Teresa, it's a long answer, but we, we need to be really creative. In, in the nutrition community. And this summit has shown the links. So we the obligation is on us now. And so as part of the summit process, there was a pre-summit that took place in July. Um, and tell us a little bit about um, that event, um, what happened at it, what most importantly, what came out of it and how was that sort of setting the stage for the summit itself that we'll see next week in New York? Well, I think the, uh, so the pre-summit was three days. Uh, it featured lots of uh, member states. We organized a couple of uh, sessions. The, the primary one was on zero hunger. Action Track One has three sort of interlinked things it's trying to do. Zero hunger, healthy diets, and food safety. That's all we're trying to do, promote those. And uh, we had lots of member states step up and say, we're going to deal with hunger. We have to deal with hunger. I, one of the first in interventions from the floor, and it got me worried because the, one of the first interventions was from an African minister who said, hunger is an ugly word. And I was thinking, oh boy, you know, are they going to say, therefore, you know, we don't want to deal with it. It's, 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 it's too difficult. Um, and they, it was exactly the opposite. They said, it's, a, it's an ugly word. Uh, it's an even uglier thing to have to happen to a family. Therefore, we have to do something about it. So I was, I was really encouraged by member state commitment I was really encouraged to see all these member states stepping up and saying, we have done our dialogues. And out of these dialogues, this is the pathway to a sustainable, transformative food system. And these are the priorities that are emerging. And I was, I was encouraged to see that so many countries had, had developed those, had done those dialogues, developed those pathways, specified their priorities. And I was pleased to see that so much of that was really a systems focus. You didn't have countries saying we have to end hunger and climate be damned. We had people saying we have to end hunger, but we have to do it in a way that generates jobs, promotes resilience, and reduces greenhouse gas emissions. And that's, you know, that's that's difficult to do those things. But they said we are we are up to the challenge. The other thing I was really encouraged by by the pre-summit was the role of youth. Um, I think we've managed to, I think we've managed to get food into the youth space. I don't quite know if we've managed to get youth into the food space, if you know what I mean. So there's, there's a very strong youth community around climate and biodiversity. And we've managed to get those people in that space more interested in food. Have we been able to get, um, have we been able to get youth interest in in the nutrition space i'm not quite so sure we've we've gone we've gone to where they are maybe that's the first step now we need to bring some of them back into where we are 
in the food and nutrition space. But I'm, I've been encouraged by how active they've been, how, um, how smart they've been, uh, and how they've been able to mobilize actors and uh, channels that we couldn't even dream of mobilizing. We don't even know they exist, let alone being un unable to, to mobilize them. I was uh, encouraged to see member states um, engaging in these coalitions, these action coalitions. Uh, eight of them were announced at the pre-summit. There will be another six or so announced at the summit. Healthy diets will be one of the ones announced at the summit. I'm very happy about that. I was a bit worried that that would get lost in the mix, but no, it hasn't been. Um, we've, we've been fighting very hard in Action Track 1, together with Action Track 2 and 3 for that. You know, it's, it's, uh, healthy diets is a little bit of a controversial issue because some, some member states think that healthy diets equates to only plant food. And of course, we're being very nuanced about that. We're saying uh, where, where some groups and some countries need to eat more animal source foods as per their own food-based dietary guidelines from that country and from UNICEF and WHO recommendations. How do we do that while also uh, generating incentives for people in typically high income settings who are over consuming way above food based dietary guidelines of those countries? How do we get a balanced message around animal source foods? And I think we've, I think we've done that. And I think we've allayed the fears of some member states, maybe most member states. So, so those are some other things. I was happy with the energy coming out of it. I thought it was good. And uh, I was, I was pleased. I, it was, it was, um, it was, it, it was, it was a good portent for the summit itself. And a lot of the organizing you've been doing uh, for the summit has invariably been virtual, uh, given by the fact that we are in the midst of a pandemic. And, you know, the Secretary General had announced this summit before uh, COVID and social distancing were things that were in our vocabulary. And so, um, you know, this, this, was already to be underway, but the majority of it has, of course, had to take place during the pandemic. And so the, the pre-summit that you just spoke about, that was partially in person in Rome. And unfortunately, the summit itself will be all virtual in New York. Um, how do you think that format will affect, you know, outcomes of the summit? And are you disappointed that after all of this work, you know, you can't all really actually physically come together and have, you know, kind of a celebration um, in, in New York of all of this time that you've been putting in? You know, I, I think this, the, the, the summit is, is kind of the, the summit is a sort of a, a ceremonial end to the, the first phase of the process. Um, it's important, don't get me wrong. We want, I want to hear powerful statements from heads of state. I wanna hear them say, um, we know we can't go on like this. We know we have to change. We've got some initial ideas about how to do that. And we, we commit to transforming our food systems over the next few years because it's good for us and it's good for everybody. So I want to hear that. Uh, they don't have to have all the answers. They don't have to make all the commitments, but I want the commitment to change and systemic change to ring loud and clear. And I want um, some of those commitments to be able to be tracked. I want all of them actually to be able to be tracked. Um, but really, the reward of the reward is is the engagement in the process. And yeah, most of it's been virtual. And yes, that can exclude people who don't get access to the internet or Wi-Fi or a four G or three G. I think we've tried really hard to to get around that. There have been so many uh, in person dialogue meetings and so many countries and so many provinces and districts to, the, to Bangladesh we again has country offices in nine countries so I know that I know the dialogues well in those countries in Bangladesh they had a you know nine dialogues they had a, a national one and then they had ones in each of the districts and then they they've they culminated in a national one at the end I mean that's that's involving thousands and thousands of people in person so I think we've tried hard to be inclusive. And I think the latest tally is 100,000 people have engaged in dialogues. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that at least 10,000 people have engaged in the five action tracks in one way or another. So it's been pretty inclusive, certainly much more inclusive than any other 
UN summit I've been involved in. But remote working, doing everything by by um, video screen, it's it's been a it's been a you know has it been a net positive or a net negative? I don't know, but it has has positives and negatives. Nothing beats meeting in person. Nothing meets. You know, they say they say that seven percent of communication is through the actual words. Another thirty-three percent of the communication is through tone, and then the rest is through body language, non-verbal body language, and you know, stuff gets lost. It's harder to negotiate. It's harder to find compromise. It's harder to find consensus when you're not doing it in person. Uh, but we just means we've had to work harder to do that. So it's 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 been fascinating and. Uh, there were only 300 people at the pre-summit. You know, 95% of the people engaging in the pre-summit were virtual. And I think, uh, I think the summit will be will be great, and there'll be hopefully 10,000, 20,000 people engaged, one way or another. And you you mentioned um, you know sort of all of the links that the process has gone to to be hmm. inclusive. Um, and as in anything, of course, there are people who don't share that view. And you know some folks have felt like um, the process hasn't been as inclusive and transparent as they wanted to. There have been concerns expressed about corporate capture of the summit, and that it hasn't been um, you know centering agroecology and farmers, particularly smallholder farmers. What is your response to um, people that have been making those arguments and um, how do you encourage them to um, you know, be involved in this process and be a part of the conversation when uh, they don't seem to want to? Well, you know, even, even folks who don't want to be a part of the summit conversation are in the food system conversation. And that's really what we care about. We want, we want everyone to be putting pressure on their governments, on businesses, on civil society, on local MPs, on school administrators, on hospital clinics, on university administrators. Get your food systems in shape. Governments buy healthy food for your schools, for your hospitals, for your social protection programs. Businesses uh, give consumers what they want. Don't, don't bamboozle them with uh, labels that they can't understand, with marketing and, uh, marketing and um, promotion strategies that incentivize unhealthy foods and unhealthy diets. You know, everyone needs to put pressure on every one of the stakeholders to get healthier diets into the limelight and unhealthier diets out of the limelight. So that's the first thing. If, if you're not in the summit process, you're still in the process. And uh, that's what really counts. I think on, on things like you know, agroecology, that, that puzzles me because there is, there's there been a very active agroecology uh, coalition um, being developed. It'll be announced at the summit. It'll be, I think one of the first coalitions that will be announced on the summit day. So that sort of puzzles me a bit. Corporate capture also puzzles me a bit because I work with 100 people in Action Track 1 and there are three representatives from business in, that, in, that, in those 100 and they're representatives from networks and associations of businesses, not from individual businesses. So again, that it, it puzzles me. So all I can say is it's the most inclusive process I've ever been involved in. Another piece I want to be sure that we touch on is accountability. You talked mm -hmm. a little bit about how, you know, this, the summit will be sort of a ceremonial culmination of all of this work, but, you know, the, the work's not done. The work doesn't end next week after the summit. The work really is only just beginning. And I think a, a big question that remains outstanding is, you know, we're expecting and hoping for announcements from governments and commitments to be made next week. Who's going to be tracking those? Who's going to be responsible for ensuring that there's follow through? Yeah, um, so you're right, Teresa, this is the end of the beginning, right? Um, we're, we're into a new phase now, post-summit. This is, as you say, when the nine-year uh, sprint, more like eight-and-a-half-year sprint, happens. So I'm not quite clear, to be honest, what the, what the formal accountability mechanism will be yet. Um, I know that the Summit Secretariat takes accountability seriously in each of the action tracks' terms of reference, when we were asked to do this, invited to do it, 
uh, accountability, set up an accountability mechanism for your action track. That was in there. So each of the action track leads has taken accountability very seriously. So there are, there are at least three accountability mechanisms that I know of that are at this stage informal and in a sense of they, they, they're not part of the formal summit structure. I hope they will become part of it. The first one is the countdown to 2030 report that I initiated with Jess, Jess Fanzo, and that involves all of, the, all of the action tracks, all of the scientists. And this is going to be an annual report that tracks food system outcomes uh, from, for all countries across those five different areas. There are, I think there are 40 or 50 indicators. The, the report will be launched in the journal Food Policy. It's coming out in October. Uh, it'll say why there needs to be a report, what it will look like, how it's governed, who makes the decisions, what will be reported on. So that's the first thing, tracking outcomes at the national and subnational level wherever possible. The second thing will be for businesses, there will be the World Benchmarking Alliance will be tracking business commitments. So a lot of businesses have been signing up to different pledges. There's a zero hunger pledge that some businesses have signed up to. There are several others on food loss and food waste. There's one on regener regenerative agriculture, one on living income in the food system. Um, the World, business uh, World Benchmarking Alliance will, will track those uh, business by business and they will report on those publicly. And then the third one I know about is one that's just emerging called the Accountability Pact. And that's being led by Boyd Swinburne, who's a professor, one of the founders of Informus, you may have heard. Uh, and he has pulled together a group of people. I'm included in that. People like Jess Fanzo are included in that. All the people who care about accountability, the Global Nutrition Report is involved in it. The Ac Access to Nutrition Index is involved in it. All the people who care about accountability uh, I've signed up to this pact, and it's a pact that will look at the commitments that are being um, made at the summit commitment register. So all stakeholders are being encouraged to sign up at the commitment register. I think it went live last week. Make your commitments as a commitment guide. Make your commitments. I think the secretariat will vet the commitments to make sure they, they meet the standards. And then the, I think the accountability pack will look very hard at those individual commitments and decide which ones to track. So I think there are lots of, and I'm sure there are others that I don't know about, lots of informal ones. The summit secretariat needs to, and I hope they will very quickly say, this is the formal mechanism. And I hope the formal mechanism will build on some of those informal, but nevertheless very rigorous mechanisms. Well, Lawrence, I really look forward to uh, following along with you and your work, um, following along with all of these accountability mechanisms. Um, I really appreciate your time today, just a week ahead of the summit. I know you're a very busy man, so thanks so much um, for being here today, helping us mark the launch of DevX Dish, and I really look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thanks, Teresa. What you're doing is so important to highlight, highlight the issues, get them to a wider audience, and you know, hold people like me and others to account. This is this is great. So thank you for the work you do. Yes, always here to ask the hard questions. Keep doing it. Thanks, Lawrence. Bye bye. Well, that was a fascinating discussion, Teresa. Um, did anything Mr. Haddad say surprise you or particularly stand out? Well, the piece of this that I have been very interested in now for, for many months, and if you had a chance to tune into our pre-summit event, um, you heard us talk a lot about this, and that is the accountability piece. Um, that to me is going to remain to be the, the center of this issue. All of this work that, you know, Lawrence just told us about that, you know, we've been covering here at DevX that's been taking place for the past year and a half. It culminates in this ceremonial event next week, but really the work is just beginning. And so we heard Lawrence tell us a little bit about some of the accountability mechanisms that he's aware of that already exist and, um, you know, that he essentially welcomed more and said, you know, we need all sorts of ways to be sure that the pledges that people are making, the commitments they're announcing next week are going to be followed through on. That's something I'm really interested in continuing to follow here at DevX and obviously we'll continue that dialogue with Lawrence as well. 
Great. And yeah, and as I teased earlier, today is the launch of DevX Dish, which you will be authoring. And so this is where our readers can come to find as you report more on the summit and all things food systems. So maybe tell us quickly um, why this newsletter, why now, and, and what to expect. Yeah, I am really thrilled that this is going to be out in the world in just a few short hours um, and that we had such a great launch event today, had Lawrence joining us. Um, as I said, he actually is very intimately tied to my interest in these issues. Um, I first went to Des Moines for the World Food Prize um, three years ago when he and David Navarro co-won the prize and um, really remember striking interviews with both of them, just the way that they spoke so passionately about the issues of malnutrition and really how they both had pledged to use, you know, this prize as a, as a jumping off point and a way to galvanize, um, you know, worldwide changes when it comes to these issues and really holding people accountable. And um, he's obviously, Lawrence has been intimately involved with the summit process. So has David Navarro and, you know, they've really followed through on, on those commitments. And so that sort of, for me, began my interest in food systems issues at DevX have taken it on as a beat. And so we, we made the decision to start this dedicated weekly newsletter to have one place for all of our DevX coverage, as well as other things that are happening happening in this very diverse sector on this very diverse topic. And we hope it's a place where you, our readers, can come learn everything uh, about this topic that's been happening in a particular week. Um, we hope you will be learning something new. Um, there'll be all kinds of analysis and um, also links to things outside of DevX coverage. So um, I'm only one reporter. Um, we do have a great team here at DevX and we, you will of course be seeing bylines from my colleagues, but of course there's great reporting on this issue all over the place. So we'll also be using DISH as an opportunity to highlight that um, as well as the many great publications that I'm sure some of our uh, watchers today organizations are, are putting out. It's always a lot to keep track of. So we really hope that this is a place that you can come each week and um, really know that we will be telling you what you need to know for that time. Great. And for our readers that maybe want to get involved or contribute their ideas, how should they get in touch or how can they get involved? Yeah, definitely. I always welcome pitches and contributions and hearing from you readers. That is one of our main goals with this newsletter is reader engagement. I really want this to be a community and I want to interact with all of you. I want to know where you're reading from. I want to know what you work on. I want to hear about your personal perspective, what your food system looks like in your community, in whatever country you're uh, joining us from around the world. So um, readers are always in touch. Uh, uh, free to get in touch with me on Twitter, um, various social media. You can also write us at dish at devx.com with any suggestions. We'll have lots of opportunities in the newsletter for reader engagement, and we really hope to hear from all of you. Great. Well, thank you, Teresa. I'm excited to get my first edition coming here shortly. Um, in the next hour or two. Um, and if you aren't subscribed, make sure to do so. We'll drop a link to where you can subscribe. Um, if you're watching through Zoom or also through social, we'll try to share that so you can make sure that you are signed up for DevX Dish. Um, please also make sure that you join us next week for our coverage of UNGA, including the UN Food System Summit. We'll have another series of events and we'll have some of our reporters on the ground in New York, bringing you the latest news, scoops, insights, analysis. Um, so we look forward to seeing you then. Again, thank you, Teresa, and thank you everyone for joining today. Thanks so much, Kate.